garage if you feel like I am so terribly terribly boring my name is Sam with an E okay? <laughs> so our story starts with a man named Gene Shepard Gene Shepard would write a book it called in God we trust all others pay cash and he would frequently frequently tell the stories from this book on his show he was on WR and WR was everywhere I mean it was big Let's play a little distance game. So who feels like they're like, they live the furthest from here? How far is it for us? Everybody from here, is it from Ohio? No. Florida. Florida. Okay, Florida. okay. Okay, would you guys, do you guys currently live in Ohio? No. So why didn't you say anything? <laughs> Did you ask whether I wanted to live here? No, I said who currently lives the furthest? Okay, so we got Florida. I heard of Connecticut, but I think Florida's a little bit further, isn't it? All right. So, Bob Clark, a man who would actually be living in Florida, he would be on, listening to the radio. He's supposed to pick up a hot date, <coughs> and he's driving around and around and around in circles. He do not care about this girl no more. He do not care about this girl no more. He is just so invested into what Gene Shepard is saying. I mean, he, we know who Mrs. Clark is not. That's all I'm gonna say. So eventually, Bob Clark would bring the idea to M MGM. Oh, right, because Bob Clark is a horror director, right? So it makes perfect sense for a horror movie director to be wanting to direct a family-friendly Christmas movie, because that just makes perfect sense. So MGM, <clears throat> well, Bob Clark has all the faith in the world in this movie. MGM is a little bit hesitant. They're like, I don't know if you know, we don't really want to fund this. We're going to be quite honest. You know, mm, but maybe if you make a sequel to a really, really popular movie that you made, then we'll fund it. He's thinking they're going to pick yeah. a film like Black Christmas or Children Should Have Played With Death Things. Those like, were two you know, blockbuster hits that he had. But no, days. they wanted a, another family-friendly movie. Okay, I'm looking at you. Porky's. Thanks. They wanted a sequel to Porky's for a Christmas story. So I guess we can really thank MGM because you got Porky's 2 and a Christmas story. It's like a bundle deal. So Bob Clark would agree. And with the money that he would actually make from Porky's 2, he would put that back into a Christmas story, giving it a budget of about $3 million. So now we got to find a location. we got to find somewhere to film. So they headed to Hippies. But why Hippies of all sorts? And well, Higby's would be one of the only stores to actually respond and say, hey, yeah, we'll keep up our Christmas decorations past March. I mean, by the time they're filming this, they're starting to film. It's December, late December, January. Christmas is over. But Higby said that they'll keep up these decorations just for this movie. They get to Higby's and it's perfect. They've got the antique toys, it, the big Christmas tree. Everything is just how they envisioned it. But... Bob Clark's not there, and neither is Gene Shepard. They're lost on the west side. I mean, who would think two men who've never been to Cleveland get lost on the west side? I mean, I still get lost coming to work every day. But instead of asking for directions or busting out that big map they had, they just keep driving. And they said, instead, we're going to head to the steel mill. So they're following the stacks, and they almost made it, but then they made a right turn down Raleigh Avenue. And then there it is, this house. And they're like, it's 
perfect. It's exactly what we need. So they go up and they get to, they get to knocking on the door. They're just knocking and then there's just no answer. The homeowner was not in. So now they're sad, they're lost. They're just, they're tired. So they're gonna do what pretty, almost everybody up here is an age. So they're gonna do what you guys would do if you guys were in this situation. They're gonna go to the bar and have a few drinks of apple juice. So they go to the bar, let's talk to the bartender. Do you know who lives there? Do you know? Not a clue. But an uh, older gentleman overhears them and he says, well, I know, you know. Uh, what do you want with the house? He's like, perfect. You know, we just wanna to talk to the homeowner. We just wanna get some outside shots, you know. Maybe just use the house. We think the house is perfect. It hasn't been updated since the 40s. And the story place takes place in the 40s because that's when Gene Shepard grew up. It's just perfect. It's really what we need. And the man goes, okay, great. So I'm actually the owner and I want absolutely nothing to do with whatever you got, whatever you got going on. I do not want a Christmas movie filmed here. He was not a fan of the Hollywood types. He didn't like the idea of a bunch of cameras and a bunch of children and a bunch of loud noise just going on around his neighborhood. So, a few more cups and the check for $20,000 later, which is about 50,000 now, we're standing in the house that about 20% of the movie was filmed in. So I think he changed his mind. So over here we've got the cast. So we've got Peter Billingsley. He was cast because of his piercing blue eyes. He was actually like one of the first of 8,000 children to try out and still got the parts. So that just speaks to how good he was in the role. Ian Petrella, during his audition, he was asked to eat a bowl of oatmeal to show mommy how the piggies eat. He thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And his laugh was so infectious that it swelled up the room and Bob Clark said, we gotta have him. So the two parents, one of these characters did not have to audition. Do you think it was Melinda Dillon? Or do you think it was Darren McGavin? McGavin. McGavin. McGavin didn't have to audition? Right. Well. You're wrong. So, <laughs> Melinda Dillon was actually the one who did not have to audition. She, for her, for her role in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Bob Clark saw that where she played a young mother and he loved her performance. In fact, he loved her so much, that's why she didn't have to audition. He said, you are so perfect, I need you in this movie. And she agreed as long as she got to pick her own wardrobe. Darren McGavin, though, was actually far from the first choice. So, like I said, Bob Clark's a horror director. He initially wanted the horror actors to play, you know, and be invested in all these characters. Cause like, what a fun twist. So, there's a, uh, can anybody name any like popular actors from like the 80s? Okay, I'm selling it. Vincent Price, all right, I've heard those names before, but I have no idea who those guys are. He actually wanted Jack Nicholson <laughs> to play the old man. So it really gives a whole new tune to when Randy's under the counter, he says, Daddy's gonna kill Ralphie, and then Jack Nicholson would pop up. That'd be pretty, that's pretty terrifying after The Shining just came out, right? That's a lot to rebrand. Nevertheless, a lot. So he was too, but he was way out of the budget, so we ended up going to Darren McGadden, who had previous credits in Night Stalker. So if you guys would turn, take a look around, or take back here. Can somebody read what it says above graduate? This is in the end up. End up. End up. So, like I said, only about 20% was filmed in here, but some of it was filmed on soundstage in Canada. This movie has a ton of mistakes, and one of them is when you're watching, when the crate appears outside the door, it says this end up. It's correct. But when it comes into the house, it says his end up. <laughs> well, when they were trying to bring it in, they realized the crate couldn't fit. So they cut about six inches off, and they just hope nobody would notice. But trust me, we did notice. It's our entire branding in the gift shop. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you guys some time to look around and interact with everything. I'm gonna call a two minute warning. And if you're down here, go up there. If you're up there, go down there. Just go anywhere that you haven't seen. 
Um, please don't turn on the voice beds, and please don't put the soap in your mouth. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Um, if you have any questions or you want me to take any pictures, please let me know. And again, my name is Ray. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to get a picture of your newspaper? Thank you. 
It's not buried in the backyard because we already checked back there. <laughs> so we've got this amazing fan art wall. So if you're an artist, we can give you an email. And if you want to send in your art, you can. I mean, wow. how many museums have a fan art wall? Mm -hmm. I can think of this many. So obviously, we're the best. Another thing is, I'm going to describe all the rooms to you and what's in them. We've got the Higby room over here. And there's some antique toys from Higby's. We've got some of Rocky's wardrobe. And then there's a movie playing in there. It's supposed to be a Where Are They Now? But it was filmed a few years ago. So it's almost like a Where Are They Then? Then we've got the Randy room. It's got a lot of Randy's costumes in there and also some little Orphan Annie memorabilia. In the room to the first room to the right, that's going to be the Canada room. So, like I said, a lot of this movie was filmed in Canada. Um, some, some scenes on the house were on a sound stage, and another thing that was in Canada was a school. So, when the boys walk out the house and they walk to school, they walk and they walk and they walk and they walk and they walk all the way to Canada. How insane is that? So, the school was called Victoria's Public School in St. Catharines. Now, it's currently a women's shelter. So, when the transition between them be, from being a women's shelter to, or from a school to a women's shelter, they would actually give us, give us one of the chalkboards that Teddy Moore used when she wrote her iconic A++++. See, Teddy Teddy Moore. She actually never made it to Cleveland. No. That reminds me. She never made it to Cleveland because she was eight months pregnant during the time of filming. But she, her character was supposed to be a single teacher in the 40s. So we can't have that kind of controversy. So they would pat her up to make her look like a plus size woman. And if you really pay attention, a lot of her scenes are behind a desk or her stomach and her lower half is somehow being blocked. So I'm gonna give you guys some time to roam around, take pictures. I'm not answering any questions about the BB gun. And then we also, have, but we do have a guest book that you guys can sign and not answer questions about anything else. All right, thank you guys.
It could be in your own garage right now. We know a lot of y'all got stuff in there. So, but how do you know? Well, for starters, it's gonna have the compass and the thing that tells time. And that's gonna be in the stock. And then it's gonna have this little tassel, but it's gonna be on the left-hand side because Peter Billingsley was left-handed. And it's, almost, it's also gonna say Plymouth, Michigan on the top, right? Because they don't really make, their BB, they don't make BB guns there anymore. But an official Red Rider for the time would never have all three of these features. While Gene Shepard insisted that his did, we kind of believe he got him a little bit confused with the Buck Jones, which was a much less popular character, but who did have his own BB gun, which did have the compass and the thing that tells time, but no tassel. But for him, Daisy just threw all three and they put it all together. So a few things about the movie. When was the last time you guys, so we all saw the movie on Christmas. Mm -hmm. So none of us saw the movie on Christmas. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so we all saw it on Christmas. So very fresh in our minds. Can we recall, think back, to the bowling chop suey palace scene? All right, you got it? So 
Melinda Dillon, her reaction is a bit more erratic, right? She's hysterically laughing. She's crying laughing, in fact, and she's cackling. She's just very, reacting very different than everybody else is. Almost like she had no idea what was going on because that was the truth. She had absolutely no idea what was gonna happen when they sat down to film that scene. So from the moment she walked in to the moment when they pulled it off, to chopping the head off, she was not acting. <laughs> she was reacting. She was scared. But that really speaks to her acting skills because it almost seems so scripted, that it's, but it's completely unscripted. Over here on these pictures on the wall, I saw a few of you looking at them. So the winner of 